As the U.S. and Chinese negotiators are continuing their talks on trade in Beijing this week, we are presenting to you this special edition of our program for the latest analysis of this bilateral relationship, arguably one of the most important ones in the world. We are talking to a whole range of American speakers, from former administration officials to longtime China hands, business leaders, and academic thinkers. They have different exposures to decision makers from both sides, and they are candid and frank in expressing their views. The interviews all took place here at the China Development Forum in Beijing. It's an annual meeting in the Chinese capital aimed at informing key players around the world as individuals or through their organizations have had a solid track record and stake in China. First, let's meet Susan Shirk, a former U.S. Deputy Assistant Secretary of State. She started her China journey in 1972. Over the past few years, she has been trying to make sense of the nature of evolving China-U.S. relations. My conversation with her started from the bilateral trade negotiations and its possible implications on global trade discussions. The economic issues between the two countries are really difficult. And even if we do get a trade agreement in the near term, mm. that I think we'll continue to have some pretty difficult issues over the fair competition questions and, uh, and technology and mm. investment. And you know, the WTO wasn't designed to address all the problems in an economic relationship. Mm. So there are still a lot of issues that WTO doesn't touch on mm. that the two countries need to work on together. But then maybe in the future, there's a possibility of some multilateral, more global agreements on some of these issues too. Yeah. So we're actually looking at two things, right? One is the bilateral relations, mm -hmm. and that of course touch on trade and economic issues. The other is how the trade and economic issues between the two countries likely to be handled within more of an international framework, and right. how will the two interact with one another within that framework. That's so right. how do you see the two tracks interact with one another, near term, of course? Yeah, well, you know, I have felt for quite some time that there's a big opportunity for China to uh, help update the WTO and strengthen the WTO because it's true that our current leadership is not enthusiastic about multilateralism, not enthusiastic about WTO. Mm -hmm. um, so the world is looking for some active, responsible leadership to help update and strengthen WTO. Mm -hmm. And it would also send a very important message that the rhetoric that President Xi espouses at Davos, Boao, and other places about support for mm. open market-based trade and uh, investment right. regimes is real. Both U.S. and China are learning about how to deal with one another. Mm -hmm. At a Learning's very, very important. different stage of our development. Mm -hmm. China, for the very first time, becomes the second largest economy in the world, even though per capita is still a very low, if you look at the list on mm -hmm. the world. Uh, the U.S. also, uh, since it becomes the largest power in the world at the end of the Cold War, for the very first time, there's a country that is look like a little bit different from us, but now become an important player onto the stage. So how will both be able to handle that learning curve, uh, therefore not to eventually lead to a lose-lose situation? Well, I study China. Yeah. I'm an American, but I study China. And as I say, I have seen tremendous learning on the Chinese side. I mean, uh, I have been so impressed with China coming into the world, trying to figure out how to handle relations with its neighbors, mm -hmm. cultivating good relations with neighbors, mm -hmm. joining practically every international organization and contributing constructively. Uh, on the U.S. side, of course it's a big adjustment to uh, have another rising power yeah. with a very different political system 
uh, different culture and everything. Um, but I think many Americans recognize that what's, it's not important about staying number one. Mm. I always say I'd rather be number two while preserving our open society and economy. Mm. You know, so I don't think this is not the playground where who's number one, who's number two is really important. Yeah. What's important is peace yeah. and that each of us, you know, have national interests that are yeah. respected. Now we see quite a Cold War style mentality and even policies about academic technological exchanges about future cooperation between the two sides on some of the most promising fields for our future as a mm -hmm. whole, for the world. Well, um, you know, I am extremely worried about this because U.S. and China are already so intertwined uh, in our universities, in our science and technology research in our tech startups. Yes. You know, I live in California, I so know. I see this firsthand. And it's been so good for human progress as well as for the two countries. I would really hate to see this uh, interfered with and the whole idea of decoupling our two economies and uh, technologies this way is really terrible because it will definitely slow down human progress. So that's why on the U.S. side I have a pretty clear uh, point of view, mm. which is that we should limit our national security mm. restrictions with export controls and with investment mm. to only those technologies that are really directly related mm to military defense. The like so-called national, real national security. You know, like sonar for submarines or something like this. But there's a real danger mm -hmm. for defining every advanced technology as a matter of national security. Because it's too easy to slip into technological protectionism. Yes. Technolo like all protectionism, it's going to make us lazy and, you know, do more poorly than if we were competing. And uh, also it can lead to a lot of very negative consequences mm -hmm. for people from China, the Chinese talent. We may lose the opportunity to attract Chinese talent to mm -hmm. our universities, to our R&D uh, operations. I mean, I, I'm in favor of competing for that Chinese talent and hoping that they will stay in America, yes. frankly. So, um, you know, I think we have to be really careful and whenever we're considering a, requ uh, a restriction, we have to think very hard about the costs and benefits of that mm. and instead have this small yard, high fence approach. Yeah. Only Do you see any sign, Professor Shirk, that people are trying to address your concern, I mean, to keep a real balance between the so-called national security concerns and the openness of the country. Well, right now I feel there's kind of in Washington, speaking very bluntly, I don't like to criticize my own country on CCTV, <laughs> but the fact of the matter is there's a kind of herd mentality yeah. and we may herd ourselves right over a cliff. So I think it's very dangerous, and that's why I find myself speaking out about this yeah. a lot. So I think there are, of course, there are other people who will, everybody will say they're trying to strike a balance, but it really all comes down to, are you, could, are you going to define all of AI as national security? Right. Um, all of biotech, you know, and we're waiting for the regulations yeah. that should be coming pretty soon, and we'll see how that balance is struck. Right. Professor, before we go, one final question for you. Mm -hmm. Will real actions be taken by both sides to save the situation? Well, that's a very tough question. I don't, uh, 
you know, I think President Trump himself has tried to set a good tone. Um, but frankly, most of the policy has been pushing back. The tariffs made no sense at all. Um, but I think there are plenty of other actors in the system yes. who are uh, who want a more vigorous debate. We are actually, for the first time in the Trump administration, we have a real negotiation underway. And the negotiation, the trade and investment negotiation, is being done by professionals. Mm. Uh, it looks like they are taking their time to get it right. They've identified our priority uh, concerns in a more, a clearer, more explicit way than they had been for the first several years. So, so you pin your hope on the trade negotiations. Is I, that what you're saying, Professor? I am, I am, to me this looks like a more or less normal negotiation. So I think both sides are motivated mm. and I think that will be a very important first step. That's Susan Shirk, a former U.S. Deputy Assistant Secretary of State.